Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for our Bible study today. Thank you because you are still God on the throne. Thank you because you are raising up a family. Not just a family, you are raising up an army. An army of soldiers that will pass through the fire and pass through the battlefield so that they can do battle for you. We are praying, O oh Lord, that in all that we go through in life, you strengthen our spiritual lives so that we'll be able to stand firm and firm true and stand loyally unto the end in Jesus' name. We pray, O oh Lord, that the study of the word of God will put backbone to our Christian conviction. And no matter what happens in the home, in the place of work, or anywhere we find ourselves, your word will always give us strength and courage to do what we ought to do, to say what we ought to say, to go where we ought to go, and to be loyal to you to the very end in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, you open our spiritual eyes that we may behold and see wondrous, wonderful things in your word, even tonight in Jesus' name. We pray that everyone that has been born again will stand firm to the very end. You know that we're going through a lot in life, but we thank you because of the assurance you have given us. That your grace is sufficient for us. We pray that every believer will find that grace abundantly, adequately sufficient in all that they may go through in life in Jesus' name. Strengthen everyone as we look at the study of the word today. In Jesus' name we pray. Praise the Lord. I welcome every one of you to our Bible study tonight in Jesus' name. For those of you who have just come in for the first time, you heard from the announcement that every Monday here we study the Bible systematically and expositorily. And that word systematically just means we go in a systematic way. And the word systematic is related with the word system. That is, you are systematic about it. It's not haphazard. You don't jump and hop. You go up slowly, steadily, and you go gradually through the word of God. The word expository means that we go from verse to verse. And we look at the difficult words. We look at the verses. We look at everything. Analyze them. Put them to pieces. Bring them together again. And apply them to our lives. So that through the study of the word of God. Or be washed and cleansed, empowered, strengthened, energized for the days ahead of us. The word of God means a lot of things to many people. And the Lord has made sure that he preserves in the word of God all that we will ever need, whatever we are going through. And so we encourage you, you are a believer, you are just trying to be a believer. You are not a believer yet. We want you to come every Monday. And as you come, the Lord will bless you as you have been blessing us in Jesus' name. Today we come to an interesting passage. It's a very good passage that introduces us uh, to what uh, you may go through when you become a Christian. And yet the joy, the excitement of the Lord standing by you and staying by you, going through all those things, you don't even know you are going through them. Open your Bible with me as we read. It's in First Peter chapter 4. First Peter chapter 4, reading from verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fairy trial that is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice, inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, I appear ye. For the spirit of glory and of God rested upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end of them be that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God 
commit the keeping of their souls to him in well doing as unto a faithful creator. As I read the passage to you, if you follow with your spirit and by the spirit of God, you have a feel of what we have in the study tonight. First of all, you have the words fairy trial and suffering, telling us that the passage is talking about that when you become a Christian, the world is not going to take it easy with you. And the people that are following the devil, they're not going to take it easy with you. And the devil and the demons are not going to take it easy with you. Look at verse 12. We have the words fairy trial. And then it says, think it not strange. In verse 13, partakers of Christ's suffering. In verse 14, reproach. You are reproached for the name of Christ. And then in verse 15, it says, suffer. Then it says in verse 16, there is suffering. If any man suffer as a Christian, you go to verse 19, it says, wherefore let them that suffer. So then you know that the passage is talking about Christian suffering. And it differentiates between Christian suffering and uh, sinners who suffer as criminals. And yet, isn't it surprising that in a passage of trial, a passage of trouble, a passage of suffering, you have a lot of joy because it talks about joy and gladness. And you look at it in verse 13, but rejoice. And then in that same place, it says, when his glory shall be revealed. In that same verse 13, that he may be glad also with exceeding joy. Which means then the Christian life is not a gloomy life. Just because you are suffering persecution, just because the world doesn't agree with your Christian life and Christian principle and Christian stand doesn't mean that a Christian life is a gloomy life, a sad life, a morose life, not at all. In fact, it says you are full of joy. There is gladness. You are, you are rejoicing because of the glory of God. It goes from joy and escalates unto exceeding joy and talks about happiness and it talks about the spirit of God and the spirit of glory resting upon you. There's something you'll notice there. The word of God is very so much different from the words of men. In the words of men, once it's negative, it's negative throughout. But in the word of God, the negative situation might be there. And then God, by his grace, injects the positive, that the glory, the gladness, and the, the power of God still moves on the righteous people, even though the suffering may be there. You know, that is not natural. That's what makes us to say that the Christian life is a supernatural life, that in the midst of the suffering, yet you can live a victorious, righteous life. But you know, many people count it strange. Because they say, if we are righteous, if we are following after the Lord, if we take Jesus Christ as master and model, how is it we will ever suffer? Well, you should understand that Jesus Christ himself, he lived the most righteous life, the most gracious life. And if there was anybody that ought to escape persecution, suffering because of holiness and righteousness, Christ should have escaped persecution. You think about John the Beloved. And the message of John the Beloved is children love one another. If you are mistaken, you'll say, if anybody live on the principle and practice of love, every time, morning, afternoon, and evening, his thought, his heart, his ideology, everything, if he lived on love, he will never suffer. You are mistaken. John the Beloved, he lived on love. He loved the people. He encouraged them to love one another. And yet, there was persecution. And that's what some Christians have misunderstood today. They have this erroneous idea that once you become a Christian, that's the end of all forms of suffering. And some ministers and preachers and churches, they even make it worse because they publicize programs. They publicize seminars aimed at ending all trials, all problems and difficulties. And they invite people. They say, come, if you are going through suffering, you are going through trouble, it means you have not discovered the secret. Come, we have seen the secret. You are going to overcome. They announce over the radio. They put it on billboard. They put it everywhere. And then you think, I've got a way out. I'm going to rush into that place because I don't want trouble. But, don't you understand? The very first person uh, in the Bible and in the creation that uh, attempted to be righteous and he was righteous by the cleansing of the blood of the Lamb, Abel, he suffered persecution from Genesis to Revelation. What we have discovered is 
is that there is nothing strange in suffering for the righteous people. In fact, it is strange when the righteous do not suffer in the world dominated by the devil. And that's what the Bible has told us in 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3 in verse 12. Yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's prophetic. And it says all in every generation at every time in any church that are born again, washed by the blood of the Lamb, and they are real children of God, and they are walking closely by the Lord, they are following after the shepherd, and they are going step by step after the watch of the Lord, and they stand by sound doctrine, all of them, in every generation, every denomination, every church, they will, they shall, they must suffer persecution. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 14, Acts chapter 14, Leading there in verse 22, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith. And that we must, are we apostles, we must. Are we pastors, we must. Are we ministers, are we members of the church, whether you are part of the clergy or part of the laity, that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. That's the revelation of the word of God and the word of God, the truth of scripture cannot be broken. It tells us in First John. First John chapter 3 verse 13, marvel not my brethren, if the world hates you. It says, I don't count it strange. Maybe I'm backsliding. Maybe I'm no more a child of God. Maybe something is wrong with me. If the devil is unhappy with me and the world is unhappy with me, maybe God is not happy with me. It says not Marvel not, count it not strange, that the world hates you. And now we go to the study proper. We're dividing the study today into three parts. Number one, the purpose of participation in Christ's suffering. Number two, the privilege and preservation in Christian suffering. Number three is the peril and punishment of chastised sinners. Now we come to point number one, the purpose of participation in Christ's sufferings. In First Peter chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, Beloved, is calling these people beloved because they are born again. It's not every church goer that is referred to you as beloved. How can a sinner, an enemy of God, come to that position where Almighty God and even the angels and Jesus Christ himself and the preachers of the New Testament will call a sinner, an enemy of God, and call him beloved. Very simple. You realize that you have been a sinner. You realize that all your good works and religious activities cannot save you. You realize that Jesus died for you on the cross of Calvary, that he bore your eternal punishment. He bore your eternal shame. Everything that shall come upon you, the Lord Jesus bore everything. And so identify with Christ on the cross and say, yes, Lord, I know you did that for me. You were my substitution. You took my place. And because you took my place, you took my sin. You took my shame. You took my eternal punishment. Because of that, your sins are forgiven. Your life is changed. You are turned around. You come into Christ, a new creature. And the Lord is not looking at you anymore as an enemy. Enemy of the cross. Enemy of Christ. Enemy of Christianity. But as a friend. As a member of the family. And now you become a beloved. If you have not done that, if you have not met Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, I'm inviting you tonight that what many people, multitudes have done here, you too, you will do. At a moment of time in your life, you surrender your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, and then you become beloved. But I have a message for you, beloved. Think it not strange concerning the fairy trial, which is to try you. And let me pick up those words, fairy trial. Now when it says fairy trial, a fairy trial for a new convert is something that, you know, those apostles of old, they will just overlook like this because it will mean nothing to them. You heard when the choir was singing about Polycarp. And Polycarp uh, was uh, killed, he was executed and burnt at the stake. Why? Because of his faith in the Lord. That was his fairy trial. Your own fairy trial is like splashing water on Polycarp. That will mean nothing to Polycarp at all. But you, because you're a new convert, that little scene, like splashing water on somebody, it will look like a big scene. And then you come to it a fairy trial. It says, whatever you call it, and whatever it seems or looks to you, count it not strange, it will come. 
as we are growing in the Lord. The things that were very trials 10 years ago, if it happens to you today, it doesn't matter again. It's like splashing water on you. And then you just brush it up and go your way as you are growing in the Lord. But at the time it's happening to you, it will look like a big thing, a fiery trial, which is to test you. It is to test the genuineness of your conversion, of your faith in the Lord. It is to test the constancy of your loyalty unto the Lord. And then it says, as though some strange sin happened unto you. When we forget history, we're going to be thinking that those persecutions are strange. When you forget Abel, you think the things happening to you from your fellow brother, a brother of the same mother, the same father, because you became a Christian, you think it's strange because you forgot Abel. What Cain did unto Abel. And uh, when you forget Moses, what Miriam and Aaron, what they did to Moses, you are going to think, I'm the isolated fellow. See what is happening to me. It never happened to anybody before when you forget David, how Saul chased him. How Absalom even wanted to drive him away from the throne and take his position. You see, you know what is happening to me? It's straight. When you forget the Lord Jesus Christ, how they crucified him. When you forget John the Baptist, how he was beheaded. When you forget Peter, James, and John, how they beat them, how they did very terrible things to them. When you forget Paul the Apostle, who went about preaching the word of God, warned to me, if I preach not the gospel, and yet everything he went through. When you forget them, you are going to think that what is happening to you is a strange thing. Not only that, there are brothers and sisters here. If you talk to one another, you listen to one another, they will tell you catalog of problems that they have gone through just because they became Christians. And uh, when you remember that, it's not going to be a strange scene that you are suffering for the Lord. In fact, you are going to rejoice because you come into good company. Because you come into good association with all the people that have suffered before you. That's why it says in verse 13, but rejoice. And as much as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering. As ye are partakers of Christ's suffering. You know what that means? A Christ is a head where the body, members of the body. And if Christ were here today preaching holiness, if Christ were here today evangelizing, if Christ were here today trying to control his life and his disciples like he controlled them at that time, with thus says the Lord, with the word of God ye have heard, it was said to them by the men of old, this, this, and this. But I say unto you, and he gave them a higher standard. If Christ were here today to emphasize and establish the same standard of the word of God, Exactly what they are doing to you now is what they do, will do to him. That's why it says they are not really doing it to you. You are a member of the body of Christ. And because that's what we have done to Christ, that's why they do it to you. So it says, aren't you happy that something that should go to Christ is coming to you? Rejoice therefore that you are partakers of Christ's suffering. And that when his glory shall be revealed. Ye may be glad with exceeding joy, because ye are they that have stood with me in the time of my temptation. And when the kingdom comes, it will make you to rule over ten cities, and five cities, and two cities, and one city, as the case may be. So then we understand that uh, it's a, it is a purpose in a participating in the sufferings of Christ. In the first uh, Thessalonians chapter 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. That no man should be moved by these afflictions. For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. It's not an accident. If I knew this will happen, maybe I will not be doing what I'm doing. No, there's no accident in it. The Lord knew about it. There's a purpose in it. We told you before, you yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it has come to pass, and ye you know. And uh, so, uh, Paul the Apostle was telling those Thessalonians, he said, uh, we're still on track, we're still moving on, it's still as it ought to be, there is nothing strange here. We told you before that we should suffer persecution, in fact, if we didn't suffer the persecution, it will be strange. It will mean that the word of God is not true. Or maybe the word of God is true, but we ourselves, we are not real Christians. If you are real Christians, it will happen. Get ready. And in Second Timothy chapter 3, 
2 Timothy chapter 3, reading from verse 12, yes, it says, And all that will live godly, men and women, boys and girls, young and old, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Maybe you are thinking that was the first century. As uh, civilization comes and people are well enlightened, uh, things like that will not continue. Paul the Apostle said, no, he said in verse 13, but evil men and seducers, shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. It tells us that as uh, time goes on and civilization comes on, it's not going to change things much uh, concerning persecution because Satan doesn't change. The word of God doesn't change. And what Satan hated in the first century, he still hates today. He hated righteousness at that time. He hated holiness at that time. He hated the followers of Jesus at that time. And he still hates them today. Satan doesn't change. What he hated, he still hates. And that's why, if you become a new creature in Christ, the hatred from the devil and the children of the devil will still come to you. In Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, it tells us, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. What he's saying there is that if you have the right attitude to your persecution, the right attitude to the things you are going through, that thing may weaken your body. That thing may weaken you in the physical. But then, as the outward, the external is being weakened, the inner life, the spiritual life, and your relationship with the Lord, and your intimacy with the Father will be strengthened as the days go by. It tells us for light affliction. You see that now. Here is the real picture. In First uh, Peter it says, the fairy trial. And what you count as a fairy trial, Paul the Apostle says actually, in the light of eternity, in the light of the sufferings of other people, comparing what you are going through with what the other people have gone through, everything you have now is just light affliction. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, just for a moment, 70 years in the light of eternity. It's like a drop of water in comparison with the volume of water in the ocean. And everything you go through now is just for a moment. It worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at things which are seen. That's the problem. Whenever you suffer, whenever there is persecution or tribulation, all the time, the devil makes you to focus on that little thing. On that little splashing of the water on you. On that little insult and that little reproach. And your eyes are taken away from Christ. And your eyes are taken away from the promises of God. But the way to have the victory is this. While we look not at things which are seen. Uh, you know, your husband denies you of your right. Your wife denies you of something. Or the in-laws are making trouble because you became a Christian. Or the places of work, they refuse to give you the increment and promotion because you are taking your Christian stand. Or it is that you have made restitution. And as a result of that restitution, they are now negative to your stand. And you are looking at that. The cross will seem heavy. You look away from what they do. You look away from how they act. You look away from everything that is going on. And you are focusing on Christ, looking unto Jesus the author and the finisher of your faith. Who, because of the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, the shame of the cross, and even died that death. And it says you have not even endured, even to the shedding of your blood. The secret is, you do not look at the things that are happening to you. You keep on looking at the glory that shall come. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal. Hey, they don't last. It's only for this life. They will not follow you to eternity. And therefore you can endure it for some time now. Just for a few days. But the things which are not seen are eternal. The things which you'll be thinking about. Meditating upon. They are the eternal things. That you will enjoy for all eternity. In James chapter 1. James chapter 1, reading there from verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith, the testing of your faith, worketh patience, but let patience have a perfect work, that ye may be perfect, entire, complete, lacking nothing, wanting nothing. And First Peter chapter 5 tells us uh, the perfecting work of uh, the tribulations and the trials and the sufferings that we go through. In 1 Peter chapter 5, reading from verse 10, But the God of all grace, 
who has called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. And then we're told in Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, reading there from verse 17, telling us of uh, uh, the things that are going to happen. If you identify with Christ now in suffering, how he is going to identify with you as he comes to reign? In uh, Romans chapter 8, reading there verse 17, and if children then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs, co-heirs co with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. As you read the scriptures, you understand that uh, these suffering, they are not negative. In fact, they are positive. And as you go through scriptures, you find the purpose of the Lord. Why will a good God, a loving God, a God that wants us uh, to be stable, not to discourage us, why will he allow us to go through suffering? A number of reasons. Number one is to teach us patience with people and with situations. When you suffer, and then you go through that thing, you begin to understand human nature. You begin to understand the nature of the world. You begin to understand that the world is not heaven. And then it teaches you to be patient with people and with situations. Number two is to make you learn obedience. That is, uh, you know, maybe you have not been very stable in your Christian life. And then the sufferings come. Then you begin to realize, okay, if I'm suffering, if I'm not living right, then I'm still going to suffer in eternity. Why don't I become so stable and steadfast so that I will know what I'm suffering for? It teaches you to learn obedience. Number three, it keeps us from pride. If you have been thinking that you are all in all, you have all the grace, and you can do everything, then a little trial comes just to show you your weakness as a human being. And then there will be no pride. You go back to God. You are able to rely on the Lord. Number four is to restore us from the wrong path. The psalmist said, I went astray until the chastisement came. And when the chastisement came, I was restored into the right path. Number five is to prepare us to comfort others who suffer. I'm told that uh, a tribe in our country here, when somebody wants to sell medicine to them and he says, this is good, it is all purpose medicine, it will cure everything, then the fellow in that tribe will say, have you had this kind of problem before? And have you taken that medicine before? And did it solve your problem? And when you are able to comfort people from the position of practical lesson. I went through that before. And this is how I got the victory. Then the other fellow will be able to listen to you. Number six, it is to prove the death of your love in Christ and the death of your love to God. Number seven, is to prepare you for greater, better, higher service and ministry. You remember Joseph? All that happened to him, they were for a purpose. And even he himself said, do not condemn yourself that you did not to me. It is for a purpose that I might be able to preserve posterity for you. Number eight, it is to make us partakers of God's holiness. The point is, is from the cross will lead to the crown. And it is from the suffering will lead to the triumph. We go to point number two, the privilege and the preservation in Christian suffering. When Christians suffer, wouldn't that discourage them so much that they will not be able to stand and they will not remain in the Christian faith? The Bible says no. Experience says no. Church history says no. In fact, the time of the greatest suffering in Christian church history is the time of the great stability of the church. And when the persecution ended and there was no persecution anymore and the new emperor that came made Christianity a state religion. No suffering anymore. No persecution anymore. Everybody was free to remain or to be Christian. It was then Christianity became Weakened. And if you look at our little history here, you will understand that in the early days of our church, it was just deeper Christian life ministry. At that time, we preached in the bus, we preached at the bus stop, we preached everywhere, and we didn't have Sunday service at that time. We went to all the other churches, and then we thought that God will use us to change all the churches. That, uh, you know, the presence of deeper Christian life ministry in every one of those churches is going to bring such a revival of holiness and restitution and restoration. Everybody will change and we don't need a separate church called Deeper Life Bible Church. 
Oh, there was persecution. There was jesting. There was reproach. But you understand, at that time, the church was strong. Persecution makes the church strong. Persecution makes the Christian strong. And so, it's a privilege that we're even persecuted and persecuted for righteousness sake. But when there's no persecution, and then we're resting, our prayer life goes now. Our study of the word goes now. Our searching, seeking of the Lord goes now. And then our firmness even goes now. In fact, when there is no persecution, and the people of the world, they love us. We, we, now, we get near our in-laws, and we eat with them, they eat with us, and everything is going on. And then they begin to influence us, and Christianity will lose its sharp edge whenever there is no persecution. And uh, it's wonderful that the Lord has made a balance, a time of rest, a time of persecution, so that our Christian life will have the correct and the right perspective. In First Peter chapter 4, reading from verse 14. First Peter chapter 4, verse 14. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part is evil spoken of, but on your part is glorified. Here he tells us the privilege you have, what a privilege it is to suffer as a Christian, not as a criminal. We must make sure it is for righteousness sake, it says in verse 15. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busy body in other men's matters. And you see, then that tells us there's a difference between the Christian and the unbeliever. There's a difference between the person that is cleansed by the blood of the Lamb and the person that has never tasted of the work of grace at Calvary. It says if you're a Christian, you suffer as a Christian. You suffer as a holy, righteous, and pure person. Let none of you suffer as a murderer. That is, you are not in any association, you are not in any gang, you are not with any group of people that will plan to kill anyone. Let none of you suffer as a thief. In your place of work, you are not stealing. In your community where you live, you are not stealing and your children are not stealing. It is not that they are reproaching you because look at his child. His child is known as a rogue. In the community, you shouldn't suffer like that if you are a Christian and not an evildoer. There should be no evil in your hand, in your place of work. You look at their work ethics there and what they expect the workers to do. And you line up with them. You show the model of a good Christian worker in that place so that any persecution that comes, you know it is not as a result that you are an evildoer. It is a result of your Christian conviction and Christian life or as a busybody in other people's matters. That he is a people that will put nose into other people's family affairs or personal affairs. Things that do not concern you. Make sure that your suffering is not like that. And once you know that you are suffering for righteousness sake, you just know it's a privilege and the Lord will preserve you. Then it goes on there in verse 16. It says, and yet, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. You suffer as a Christian and there is no shame. You know, the world, they would like to make you feel ashamed. Instead of they feeling ashamed that they are sinners. Instead of them feeling ashamed that they are not preparing for eternity. They will turn it around and they will make you the follower of Christ. The one that is following after righteousness and try to make you feel ashamed because of your dressing. You know, they dress in the worldly way. And they are almost naked. And every secret part is outside. And you are dressing sensibly. And you cover every part. And you are neat and you are a godly woman. And those people that should be ashamed, they are very bold. They will look at you like this to turn around and make you doing the right thing to be ashamed. The people that are stealing. And they will not make any confession. You will not steal. The one you took before you were born again, you, you return to them. You made restitution. The people that are doing the evil, they will turn it around. And you making restitution, wanting to make right your way, saying, I stole this before. It's not my property. It doesn't belong to me. I return it to you. They will be talking. And then the way they talk and the way they act is to make you feel ashamed. That's why the Bible is saying, if you are suffering as a Christian, and you are taking your stand, and they try to make you feel ashamed, be not ashamed, but let him glorify God on this 
behalf. And you need to keep on glorifying the Lord. And in the midst of it all in verse 19, we are calling him that suffer according to the will of God. Commit the keeping of their souls to him in well doing as unto a faithful creator. You commit yourself unto the Lord. You do not allow them to make you feel ashamed in any way. And then in Luke chapter 6, we're looking at Luke chapter 6, reading there in verses 22 and 23. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. And you see that Jesus knew that that will happen. And sometimes, you know, in the natural, that is very, very painful. And the people you grew up with from primary school, the people you grew up with, uh, you know, in your life, uh, you've been so attached to them. And now, as uh, you know, they know you're attached to them. It's like they are your very source of joy. It's like, uh, you know, you see them, you're happy, you don't see them, you, you feel you're missing something, something is missing out of your life. Then you became a Christian. You became a child of God. And you are so excited because every time a good thing happened to you in the past, you run to them and say, come, come, come. Let me share with you what has happened to me. And then you go to them now. A good thing has happened to you. Christ has come to your heart. Your life has been totally changed. The burden of sin is taken away. And you are happy. You almost see the vision and the glory of heaven. And you say, my friend must hear this because I don't want to get to heaven alone. He must come with me. And you rush to them like you used to do when some good things happen to you. And then you tell them, they say, is that what you are excited and enthusiastic about? You join those born again, born again people. You've gone the wrong direction. If you don't, uh, you know, wash up that thing from your mind. We are not friends anymore. I don't have any other friends. Those are the only friends you have. And when they take your name away from the association and they show that hatred to you, uh, the tendency is you'll feel so sorry for yourself. Have you done the wrong thing until the Holy Ghost will come and comfort you? That's why Jesus Christ, he was preparing their mind. He said, blessed are you. Happy are you. When men shall hate you. And when men shall separate you from their company. And they shall reproach you. And cast your name out as evil. For the sake of the son of man. Rejoice ye in that day. And leap for joy. Jump for joy. For behold your reward is great in heaven. For in the like manner did their fathers unto the prophet. Actually it gives you the privilege of being one with uh, the prophets of old. And also being one with the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Because we're told in Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12, reading there from verses 2 and 3, looking unto Jesus, that's a secret, he went through it, looking unto Jesus, you don't look sideways, you don't look to other things, you don't even look at yourself, if you look at yourself, you'll be pitying yourself, see what Christianity has done for me, I used to be happy, I used to be, you know, uh, loved and lovable by people. But now I become a Christian. I'm born again. I'm a new creature in Christ. And see what is happening to me now. If you look at your situation, you have self-pity. But looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest he be wearied and faint in your mind. Count it a privilege. What has happened? And then there will be, there will be no problem at all. You'll keep on rejoicing. And in fact, the Lord is going to use all that to preserve you and to perfect everything that concerns you. In Psalm 138, uh, verse 8, it says, The Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. The only thing is that you must let him use any instrument, any tool that he wants to use in perfecting you. But he will do it if you allow him. It tells us in that uh, passage we have looked at in First Peter chapter 4. First Peter chapter 4, reading there in uh, verse uh, 14. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, appear ye for the spirit of glory, and the spirit of God resteth upon you. The spirit of God rests upon you, abides with you. What does he do, number one? He comes to comfort you. And when you allow the spirit of God to take over your life in the time of that persecution, you go more into prayer. You go more into being indwelt, saturated by the Spirit of God at the time of persecution. He abides with you, number one, to comfort, number two, to share the love of God abroad in your heart. 
Because the human tendency, natural tendency, is to hate the people that will allow themselves to be used by the world or by the devil to bring persecution unto you. It's the Spirit of God abiding in you that will share the love of God abroad in your heart. Number three is to give you hope. Uh, so that you'll be able to have hope. You know, they say it's not forever. In fact, it's just for a short time. Number four is to give you wisdom to answer and relate with the persecutors. When the Spirit of God abides in you, He gives you wisdom so that you'll be able to answer those persecutors. And also to relate with them. Number five, it is to give multiplied grace. To endure unto the very end. When the Spirit of God is there, you'll be hearing Him saying, My grace is sufficient for you. And therefore you'll take delight and rejoice in reproaches in persecution. In scarcity. Because the Spirit of God abides, multiplying His grace in your life. Number six is to reveal deep things of God unto you. Necessary for your victory. Number seven is to assist you in prayer. For we know not how to pray or what we must pray for. But the Spirit of God abiding with us at such a time, we're going through those things. He is the one that makes us uh, to pray as we ought to pray. And what joy do we have knowing that the Lord moderates everything, controls everything. And He will not allow anything to come your way that is much more than you can bear. In First Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13. First Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13. It says, there has no temptation taking use, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. But we will the temptation or the trial also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Anything that happens then, the Lord has a purpose and the Lord has a goal. And the Lord is moderating everything. The Lord is controlling everything. And uh, he has, is going to perfect and purify you through it. But you ask the question I, about the people that suffer and they are backsliding. And then in their backsliding, they are still suffering. How about the people that suffer? And then the uh, unbelievers, they have not even given their lives to the Lord. What can we say about their suffering? Of course, you understand that there is nobody that can pass through this life without some suffering. Whether a Christian or an unbeliever, unbelievers suffer too. Sinners also suffer too. But as they suffer in this world, what will be the final thing that will happen to them? Even in eternity. Look at it now. We're going to point number three. The peril and punishment of chastised sinners. In First Peter chapter 4, verse 15. But let none of you suffer as a murderer. Which means murderers suffer. There are those who suffer as a murderer. Or as a thief. Thieves suffer. And you've seen them sometimes on the street. When the mob will take stones or they'll take a tire, put it on their neck and burn them right there. And uh, they, they, they suffer to you. And uh, when they don't do that and they take them to the court, eventually they land in the cell, they land in the prison. Thieves suffer. Or as an evildoer, evildoers suffer. Uh, you know, they suffer locally. Uh, their neighbors, they make them to suffer. The government, sometimes if they catch them, they make them to suffer. Or as a busy body in other men's matters. And some of the suffering even continues for a long time. In verse 17, for the time is come. That judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, that is, if those of us who are born again, those who are children of God, those who are studying the word of God and praying day and night, if they suffer, if it first begins at us, even the judgment, the evaluation of God, if it begins at us, what shall the end of them be that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, if the righteous, the people that are born again, the people that are holy, if when they are to get to heaven, the devil still follows after them and he holds on their dress and he says, come back here. You belong to me. Uh, because you remember that time when you did this, when you said this. Even the people that are righteous, when Moses wants to, you know, wants to go to the presence of God, and angel Michael was uh, coming, and he wanted to take him. You know, the devil even battled us. No, he belongs to me. You know, he did this, he did this, until the angel was able to say, the Lord rebuke you. This man is free because he's been covered by the blood of the Lamb. Any house where I see the blood, I will pass over that house. This is the redeemed of the Lord before the devil even went away. And we in our Christian lives, in our own moderate way, we cannot boast to be like a Moses. 
maybe you heard that Moses uh, spoke unadvisedly with his mouth just once. But if you look at the life of Moses, what a great man he was, what a perfect man he was. If we compare ourselves with Moses, there is no place to stand. And if the devil will battle for the eternity of Moses, I but you and I, where would we stand without the love of God, without the grace of God? That's why it says, if the righteous cast may be saved, almost lost, but yet eventually they are saved by the grace of God. I but the people that never knew the Lord, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? It's a terrible sin for the people that have never put their faith in the Lord. It will be a terrible sin for them in Matthew chapter 3 verse 9. Matthew chapter 3 verse 9. And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you, That God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit, Is cut down, hewn down, and cast into the fire. Is still emphasizing the same thing that we are looking at here. That the people that are only religious but not righteous, the people that do not put their full faith in the Lord, when the judgment shall come, the judgment will overtake them and uh, they will perish. You know, it talks about it as the people that obey not the gospel. How do you understand that? The people that do not obey the gospel. The gospel has been given to us. The fullness of the gospel. The reality of the word of God is being given unto us. The question is, are we obeying that gospel? Are we obeying the light that we have heard, that we have known of the gospel? All that our conscience said yes to in the word of God. All that we have read in the word of God, emphasized, taught, and systematically by the spirit of God. Uh, is our conscience bearing us witness that we are obeying that sin? Because if we do not, it says, What shall the end be of them that do not obey the gospel? In Luke chapter 12, Luke chapter 12, verses uh, 47 and 48. And that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. If we know the word of God, the standard of his word on repentance, on restitution, on living a righteous, a holy life, on sanctification. If we know the standard of the word of God, that this is the way we ought to live. Husband and wife, there should be no divorce. It shall remain together until death do you part. If you know that word of God, and then you turn around. Knowing the will of God, you refuse to do that will of God. You'll be beaten with many stripes. If you understand what that means, there is no beating in heaven. And they are not going to tell people in heaven to lie down and be beating them. That means going to hell. It means there is eternal judgment, eternal punishment for such an individual. In verse 48, But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. If you didn't know, you are not in a church like this. You go to a church where they do not teach on holiness. You go to a church where they do not emphasize, follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. And say, praise the Lord, I'm not in deeper life, where they teach systematically and expositorily. Our preachers never talk about it, so I'm just going to pretend I don't know anything about holiness. If you do something worthy of stripes, you're still going to be beaten. The punishment will still be there. And then it says, For unto whom so ever much is given, of him shall much be required, and to whom men have committed much of, the, of him, they will ask the more. Therefore it means that we need to be obedient to the Lord, and we need to obey the word of the Lord. Because terrible is the end of the people that do not obey the gospel of the Lord. In Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10, reading there from verse 25. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 25, it says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as a manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as ye see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully, if we sin willfully after we have come to a church like this and we know that there should be no unequal yoke be not unequally yoked together with some believers ah, i cannot wait again i'm going to do what i need to do uh, age is telling on me i'm just going to marry anybody i'll go to the village and do as i want to do if we sin willfully 
And you know that you used to have a problem with alcohol and with drugs and with cigarettes. And then instead of resisting temptation, and you go back to that thing now, if we sin willfully, if you go back to those, uh, the vomit that you have vomited, and the evil thing you have abandoned, and the worldly things you have abandoned, if we sin willfully, the church is not serious about it again. When they were serious about it, and they were mentioning it almost in every message, I took my son, I threw away the thing, I was, you know, almost fanatical about it, but you know, I've not heard it now from, you know, the preaching, uh, the past few months, maybe the thing is not important again and then you go back to the vomit it says if we sin willfully after that we have known we have received the knowledge of the truth there remains no more sacrifice for sin but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries he that despises moses lord died without mercy on the two or three witnesses verse 29 of our march sorrow punishment suppose he shall he be thought worthy who has trodden underfoot the son of god and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and has done despite under the spirit of grace if we go back into our evil if we go back to the things we forsook before what great punishment will come upon our lives that's why the lord is calling upon us now and he's saying we need to examine ourselves if we're still standing in the faith we need to examine ourselves whether our hearts are right with the lord the way we loved the lord before the way we gave our lives to the lord before the way we were fully dedicated to the lord before and the way we did everything as under the close intimate direct eyes and sight of the lord if it is so or if it is no more so then we evaluate our christian life and see if we need to make any correction in second peter chapter 3 second peter chapter 3 for these they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of god the heavens were of old and they are standing out of the water and in the water whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished for the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men that means judgment is coming uh, those who have suffered in this world if you suffer persecution and you remain righteous and remain faithful unto the lord and you do not yield your ground what you know to be the word of god to be the requirement of the christian faith you are still standing upon it whether we are there with you living with you or not and you are taking your stand when the trumpet shall sound the lord will know the people that have been loyal and faithful unto the sin that have been committed into their hands and then the Lord will say, well done, a faithful servant, come into the joy of thy Lord. It will be glory and joy and blessing forever and ever. But if you have not lived a righteous life, in the secret you have been committing sin, in the secret, uh, you know, uh, the leaders of the church are not here members of the choir are not here and the ushers are not here our colleagues who are working together and the church they are not here i can do anything i want to do that's very dangerous because it says in verse 10 for the day but the day of the lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat and the earth also and the works uh, that are therein shall be burnt up seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved what manner of person ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness looking for and hasting unto you, the coming of the day of god wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall met with fervent heat nevertheless we according to his promise look for new heavens and a new earth where dwelleth righteousness wherefore beloved beloved children of god and that time can be any time from now because he'll come as a thief in the night seeing that ye look for such things be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless why don't you come to the lord today there's still cleansing available and the blood is still flowing from emmanuel's vein and if you dip yourself in the fountain of the blood of the lamb then you'll be cleansed today if you wait you may wait too long it may become too late that then the door is closed and those foolish budgets they begin to knock open unto us open unto us and he says i know you not i don't know from where you are before it becomes too late and before the door is closed 
if you have been suffering and not because of your sin, because of your uh, inconsistency, if you have been suffering like that, you come to the Lord and say, Lord, wash me, cleanse me, purify me, put me within and without, so that you will prepare me for that day that is coming. Why don't you rise up and tell the Lord, I need cleansing. I need cleansing. There is still chance for you now. There is still opportunity for you now. Don't continue to sin willfully in your place of work, in the place where you are living. Don't continue to do things you know to be wrong. Give yourself to the Lord. Abandon yourself in the sight of the Lord. If you expose yourself and expose your sin, the Lord will cleanse you. The Lord will cover you. The Lord will have mercy upon you. If you cover it up, then on the final day, where will you stand? The Lord loves you. The Lord loves you. The Lord loves you. He wants you to be cleansed. And the blood of Jesus is still available. He will cleanse you. He will forgive you. He will change your life. You will be born again if you have not been born again. If you are a child of God, but there is something wrong, He will forgive you and He will restore you. If you need sanctification, He will sanctify you. He will give you that holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And then whatever comes after that experience, He will give you grace to endure to the very end.